So, uh, so today we're going to talk about a topic which carries particular weight when there are versions of this class with larger teams. But it also links in with the entrepreneurship chapter and then more generally with some of the major themes of this course around software quality and software processes. And uh, this consists of this the the topic of, of system syncing for for software projects sort of understanding what's going on in software project um, in terms of different metrics or in terms of different considerations quality the sort of the timing um, that do you remember that very first day we talked about the iron triangle what were the three points of the iron triangle money quality and time yeah money quality time or, you know, really quality is often includes value delivered because it's often scope. But um, really thinking about those uh, together and thinking about them together with client satisfaction and thinking about them together with things like morale, uh, even things like, like uh, trust. And in the context of managerial decision making, for example, pressure when a project's behind. Um, and the motivation for this basically reflects the fact that um, in the software industry, um, and particularly in some companies, like Electronic Arts is, is famous for this, other, other game manufacturers, there's, there's a real reliance on uh, long hours uh, for developers. Um, uh, other companies make use of metrics to make decisions, uh, but have learned through being burnt that some of those metrics have problems because they set incentives. So for example, if you reward people whose code has been reported to have very few bugs, there's an incentive there to hide bugs, for example, for your code, so you can get rewarded for it, right? Or if you reward lines of code produced, there's an incentive to check code in before it's well tested, before it's inspected, before it's slowed down, it would be the crude, naive way to view it by some of these processes. Um, in other cases, you know, I've worked for managers who have tried to use abuse to scare the team into delivering more quickly, you know, um, and, and push them to the point where turnover is a big issue, people leave. Morale is a big issue, and it starts really, really impacting the quality of the, of the product produced. Um, and really, a lot of these are consist of situations where uh, team members, or most commonly a manager of the team, often not technical themselves, are trying to optimize some outcome. Maybe it's time, how, whether the project will come in on time. Or maybe it's the quality of the project, or maybe it's the, the scope of features included. They're trying to push for a goal there, but they're ignoring side effects of their actions. And it ends up getting really bad quickly sometimes. So it's this sort of snowballing effect that Jesse would have heard about in, in my, uh, one of my other courses, 394, where things get bad really, really quickly. I mean, within a few months, things can go to hell in a handbasket. Um, people leave, morale is shot, the quality suffers, um, there's uh, a lot of load and the remaining people are there, which leads to more, more people leaving. The people who are left are often the less productive people in the first place because they have less good job opportunities, and it's a real problem. And you get these sort of vicious cycles. Um, it, it can be difficult for managers to change this once it's gone in that direction. and. And project management, um, as Austin may have discovered, uh, I suspect Ecrum discovered, is, is, um, is actually uh, a very complex thing, okay? So we're gonna be taking a look at this phenomenon of sometimes known as systems thinking, which is, is really trying to broaden the scope of what people consider when making decisions with respect to these projects and thinking about how the various sides of the project are linked together not focusing on symptoms like whether a project's behind schedule, whether you know the bugs are particularly uh, there's particularly many defect reports being generated, 
um, the number of lines of code per day, but thinking about what's giving rise to them, the sort of underlying drivers for these, and really focusing on enhancing those uh, in a positive direction. Okay, um, and the recognition here is if you if you undertake this in the right way you can much more effectively manage a project than if you're focusing on the symptoms. Um, and the reason for this is, is software quality is a systems issues. It's not any one piece of the project that makes it successful. It's the coordination of a lot of different things, including harder factors like quality of unit testing or use of assertions or uses of good, uh, good architectural principles, or good unit tests. But it's also, it's also softer elements, like uh, the amount of trust with the project manager. It's issues having to do with the level of turnover and the morale on the project. These are all, it turns out, really, really important. And traditionally in software projects, if you look back, those sides have been ignored. This is a course which focuses on not just the technical side, but the processes that make good technical side effective. Um, and uh, it turns out a systems thinking lens is, is good for that, okay? So it turns out that at the heart of these is perhaps not surprisingly, quality, software quality. Turns out the quality of the software code base is arguably the single biggest determiner of project success in the medium and long term, and some in the short term. It ends up affecting time, how quickly you can deliver reliable product, product that the client actually uses as a real asset value, the prospect for quickly modifying the project given needs, but it also affects things like the cost side, how much time you're spending debugging, spinning your wheels, doing testing and debugging cycle after cycle because you're finding lots of bugs. It affects the ability to deliver on time, therefore. But it also affects things like morale and turnover, like that a project will be canceled and upstream and, and, and downstream work in terms of what's done in terms of the architecture and, and the downstream side of the, uh, the software debugging and, and, uh, and testing. So feedbacks um, uh, within this context, as we'll talk about, have a major impact on the dynamics of software. So if you look at a software project, you can actually use uh, a diagramming methodology that I teach in 394 that Jesse will recognize. It's called causal loop diagramming. To model, to characterize, to model out here at a qualitative level, there's actually quantitative models of these that, that we also built, sort of the linkage between different factors. And I'm going to today, quickly, but in a way I hope will stick for the final exam at least, walk you through how you can use these sort of methods to, to diagram linkage between projects. And one of the things you'll find if you start to think about how disparate factors on a project that, you, that have different numbers associated with them coming in, quality metrics associated with bugs per thousand lines of code or the amount of code produced in terms of lines of code per day or aspects of, of the uh, number of defects found, number of defects fixed, etc. Those are all coming from some underlying system. They're coming from a a set of factors that are linked. And even things like fatigue and the amount of overtime people work and the amount of pressure people put on from the managerial side are all linked. And it turns out that quality, and I've even drawn this in a kind of uh, circumscribed way, it actually includes some of, these, um, some of these elements here as well. Quality is a really big factor in, in all of this. It has to do with Factors that end up driving morale, factors that end up linking to sort of the amount of overtime worked and the fatigue. It ends up affecting turnover. It ends up affecting client satisfaction. And it ends up affecting ultimately the likelihood that your project will be canned 
or will achieve market success. Um, so it's very important for a small company. I know one small company went through a period of, of real quality problems and, and you know, it was a real problem for them to grow effectively because new clients would encounter errors, start to complain. They talked to other new clients. There was negative word of mouth and it was hard to keep those clients. By contrast, with a high quality product, the clients feel it's really slick and they're more likely to use it multiple times, spread good news about it, etc. So this is all part of some underlying system, it turns out. Um, fatigue is not divorced for the number of defects that are around or client satisfaction or indeed the amount of turnover. These are linked in an underlying system. And we're gonna learn how to draw up these diagrams and I hope they'll stick because they're really useful for thinking through how a bunch of factors are related to one another, okay? So, so this is called a causal loop diagram. Um, and uh, basically it captures positive, sort of our understanding of likely positive effects between variables, meaning how one variable is driving another, is influencing the other, is affecting another. Okay, um, and it's especially good for indicating feedback effects. For example, there's a feedback here between morale and resignations. And you'll notice this feedback has some polarities associated with this. So as morale goes up, resignations will tend to go down, all of the things being equal compared to the value it otherwise would have had. And as resignations go up, morale will tend to go down. And that leads to a reinforcing feedback, a kind of vicious cycle where if morale worsens, what happens here? Resignations go up. Resignations go up and as resignations go up, what happens further to morale? It goes, down. It goes worse. And so there's kind of a, a potential death spiral here, right? But that's just one of many feedbacks. For example, there's a feedback through that on new hiring and training needs, the amount of the amount of, it limits the amount of work accomplished per day, which in turn may, may lead to higher amounts of overtime being needed and higher levels of fatigue, and which neglects uh, testing, but can also lower morale, and you get a vicious cycles here. And you get cycles in terms of client satisfaction, on managerial pressure for overtime morale, uh, a neglect of quality if you don't watch out for it in a cycle there, okay? So here we have these feedbacks. Uh, these feedbacks are illustrated when we have one of these loops. If we have uh, a path that goes from A to B and then B back to A, we talk about that being a, a causal loop or a feedback, okay? And these feedbacks can basically be of a couple types. But in order to understand the types of feedbacks, we first need to understand the types of these links. Like why do I have negative links here associated with each of these links? Why do I have these links shown here with certain polarities, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through what these links mean. So basically a, a positive link, so a link from mistakes to learning from mistakes, for example, means, so if we have a link from A to B with a positive polarity, it means all other things being equal, if we raise A, it will, as a result, it will force a decrease in B compared to the value B otherwise would have had if A hadn't been changed. In other words, all, and, and it does so, all other things being equal, if everything else is held constant. Okay, so here, if mistakes go up, hopefully it leads to what? More, More learning from mistakes. That's why there's a plus. Mistakes go up, this tends to go up compared to the value it otherwise would have had with nothing else having having changed besides that one thing. It'll tend to increase this compared to what it would have otherwise had. By contrast, a negative link means the converse, and, and let's trace that through. So if I increase learning from mistakes, hopefully my learning from mistakes, if I have better and better learning from mistakes, what does that tend to do, hopefully? Decrease, decrease the amount of mistakes I've made, I make, all of the things being equal it'll tend to 
lead to a decrease in the mistakes I make relative to the value, relative to what it would have otherwise been had I not learned from my mistake. Does that make sense? And you'll notice it's changing it over time. As I make more mistakes, I learn from mistakes over time. So it's not this is an instantaneous relationship. It's this will tend, to, if this goes up, it'll tend to increase that compared to the value it would have had you know, over time and, and uh, vice versa here. So this is a negative polarity because as this goes up, this will tend to go what? Down, Down compared to the value it otherwise would have had. Okay, um, so we're going to draw out some of these things, and they they can be quite big. So when you're thinking about this, you, you, it, it's easy to get confused about the lengths for a for a connection. So you should really approach it carefully. Just think about that connection in isolation. You're attaching a link to that connection in isolation. The fact that it's part of a system we'll take care of later. But you're thinking about a link in isolation, let's say between fatigue and the amount of work accomplished per day. And you're going to ask yourself, look, as, as fatigue goes up, will work accomplished per day go up or down? Well, as fatigue goes up, work accomplished per day will go what? Down. down. So we put a negative link on this, okay? There may be times where in this broader diagram, fatigue goes down, um, which is, is fine, but in order to assign a link to a, 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 an arrow uh, from A to B, or reason if A goes up, does B increase or decrease compared to the value it otherwise would have had? Um, all of the things being equal. So reason about an isolation, okay? Um, now, I'm on, time is limited. I won't go into some tips, but generally, when you label these things, you're using noun phrases for things, and lengths should have an unambiguous polarity, and, and we'll talk about that. Like, maybe there's a link right now in your diagram. Maybe you might be tempted to put a link between overtime and the work accomplished per day. I mean, actually, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to say, look, overtime probably causally impacts. It has some impact over time on the amount of work accomplished per day. Mm -hmm. But if you just put one link, there's a problem. Why is there a problem? Why would there be a problem? There's so many other factors that can affect it. Well, there can be some other factors, but what we want to focus on between these two is actually over time, maybe this is what you were getting at, Mo, over time has several types of different effects of work accomplished per day. Look, over time really, if you, if you think about it, as I spend more overtime, um, it has several different, as we say, pathways to effect, several different ways in which it affects work accomplished per day, several different generative pathways. Um, one, one way is, look, we spend more time working, so we get more accomplished, right? That's, that's the idea. You know, you're spending more time, and, and that, if, if we consider that alone, you know, we tend to get more work accomplished. But, as Mo was indicating, there's several different things playing. So more overtime we have, eventually we'll tend to get fatigued and that will tend to lower our efficiency, which lowers our work accomplished per day compared to the value it otherwise would have had. Yeah, Mo? Wouldn't it have to be like overtime, more time working, more fatigue, less efficiency? You, you, you could do that. Um, I like that idea. So in other words, should we have drawn more time working to fatigue? Sure, I would have been glad to do that, and that wouldn't change the uh, the nature of what I'm I'm arguing here. Uh, this little cross hash there that indicates so these two things that indicates a long delay, and typically this effect is an immediate effect. You put in more time, get that. But no, you could have put a, one of these links here from more time working to fatigue. And that would absolutely be correct. And I would say that's a sharpening of the diagram. So I like it. Um, and uh, I may go off and make that happen after class. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's a good sharpening. It doesn't affect what I'm about to say. So, so think about it here. And you'll notice that I'm now reasoning not about one link in isolation. I'm reasoning about each link. So 
to think about how to label these with polarities, I think about each link. Has overtime increased? Does fatigue increase or decrease compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal? Or as fatigue goes up, does efficiency, if I have more fatigue, does my efficiency go up or down compared to the value it would have had? I might put a negative link. As my efficiency goes up, notice I, I, how I said that. As my efficiency goes up, how does it change my work accomplished per day? Does it increase or decrease it compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal? Well, you tell me. As efficiency goes up, do I get more accomplished per day, per day done or less compared to the value I otherwise more would have had? I get more done than if my efficiency hadn't gone up. Uh, I get more done if it did go up, right? Than I would have otherwise. So we assign each of these links to these, no, these polarities to links, reasoning about each link in isolation. But watch now how I reason about the impact of overtime along these pathways. Each pathway consists of not just one link, but a chain of links, right? So let's think about, okay, so as overtime goes up, for example, it tends to lead to more time working, and as more time is worked, more work is accomplished per day. Along this pathway, there's more work accomplished per day. Let's think about these other uh, pathways. As overtime goes up, fatigue eventually goes up. That's why there's a delay here. And as fatigue goes up, efficiency will tend to go down. And as efficiency, notice, notice my reasoning as along the whole pathway, as efficiency goes down, my, my work accomplished per day will go what? Down. down. And this is why sometimes plus is labeled as like same direction with an S. If efficiency goes up, work accomplished per day will go what? Up. up compared to what it would have otherwise been. If efficiency goes down, work accomplished per day will tend to go what? Down. down. So think about, let's think about the net effect. Overtime goes up, fatigue goes up, fatigue goes up, efficiency goes down, efficiency goes down, work accomplished per day goes what? Down. down. So the net effect along this entire pathway is overtime goes up, work accomplished per day goes what? Down. down. Same thing with this pathway. As I work overtime, look, if I'm working each night till 10 p.m., here at work. There are certain things which I've got to do at work that normally I do at home. Maybe I want to watch a TV show. Maybe I'd, I'd need to, you know, uh, make some arrangements with my bank over the phone. Maybe I need to, you know, call some of my relatives to straighten out an issue from work. And what that leads to, inevitably, is a greater incorporation of tasks that otherwise would be held outside of work to be inside. And that leads to less efficiency. Those extra hours till 10 p.m. are not pure work hours. I'm mixing it with watching TV and maybe playing a little Tetris or something and, um, and you know, going and, and calling people. It's not full efficiency. It's reduced efficiency. And that lowers my amount of work accomplished per day compared to what it would have been. So this pathway too, over time, greater incorporation, efficiency, work accomplished per day, it tends to, to lower it compared to the amount of, that it would have had. Um, but this one tends to increase it. And that's why this is not a suitable thing. It's because, and Mo may have been alluding to this, it's not a simple story. How does overtime affect this? It, over, it affects it in different ways here. And often, people putting in overtime focus on this pathway, but eventually this one kicks in. And this will be a big part of our story. Okay, so you'll notice how I went from reasoning about particular lengths here to reasoning about whole pathways here. And I reasoned about a pathway thinking about it as a whole, as like overtime goes up, our work accomplished per day, the net effect of that pathway is to lower it, for example, through fatigue, yeah? Now, consider our pathway now, which goes from a variable and loops around back to that original variable. This is the simplest example right here, right? It's a simple example. Mistakes go up, learning from mistakes goes up, and hopefully that lowers mistakes. That's a 
That's a complete pathway too. That's a complete chain, right? Do you recognize that? It's a complete chain. And what's the polarity associated with this chain? As mistakes go up, learning from mistakes goes up. As learning from mistakes go up, mistakes goes what? Down. Down. So it's a negative feedback loop. It's a, it's a feedback going here where it's negative in, in polarity. What does that mean? Well, it means, look, if, if I start to make more mistakes, there's sort of a self-correcting process that can be operating. It's sort of self-limiting, right? Hopefully, I make more mistakes, I get some feedback on that, maybe I see my program doesn't work anymore, I've screwed up the config file, and I go and fix it, and now it works. I learn from my mistakes, and then I make, I'm less likely to mis make mistakes of the same type again, right? I learn, oh, okay, that's how you, 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 you uh, avoid making this sort of error in React Native or what have you. So it's a self-correcting process. That initial foray in terms of mistakes getting worse cancels it, if it, if it doesn't cancel itself out, it, it puts pressure back on itself. It, it's self-correcting in the sense that it, it lessens its own effect over time through learning from mistakes. Do you understand that? It's kind of like if you're driving a car and you notice it going a little bit towards the center of the road, you correct. And that it corrects for that, right? It, it pushes back against the original change. So that's a negative feedback. It's, it's also called the regulatory feedback because it regulates itself. We notice something going out of whack and we regulate it back into the right thing. We, we do this all the time with sleep. You do it all the time with eating. You do it all the time with drinking water. You do it all the time with all sorts of things through your life um, where you put in place some correction from driving to day-to-day -day processes of diverse sorts, right? Okay, um, and what we're dealing with here, these loops are called feedbacks. This is a causal loop. It's a loop involving cause, putative causal factors, and it's, it's a feedback. This, in this case, is a negative feedback. Why? Because that whole pathway was associated with a negative, like, just like, this pathway was associated with a negative link, whereas this one was a positive link. If it loops back on itself, then we label it the whole thing as being that. And it turns out that's really important. If it's a regulatory loop, it'll tend to be self-stabilizing. It'll tend to limit its excursions. By contrast, if it's a positive loop, it'll tend to amplify its excursions. It'll tend to get to change faster and faster. That initial impetus to change will be reinforced and reinforced, okay? Um, so we classify these, these loops. And it turns out that people who are acute observers of the software scene have noticed this. So Bill Gates is on record, um, you know, on, on talking a lot about feedbacks involving market forces, you know. So he says, look, the biggest advantage we have I would note Microsoft has just passed Apple as the, uh, the company with the biggest earnings, I believe it is. Biggest advantage we have is good developers like to work with good developers. You get some good developers, they help draw in really, really good people, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the more users the internet gets, more contents it gets, which attracts more users. So feedback sort of thinking, right? We, we get some initial change, it leads to some further impetus, which drives and even amplifies, in this case, the original change, right? Um, how's this? Um, many people, you know, so we have this whole group of 2,000 people in the US alone that takes phone calls about our products and logs everything that's done. So we have a better feedback loop. Right? We get to know about the problems with our project, with our products, we go fix them, and we can, evolve better, better products very quickly. We can correct the bugs that are out there in our products, right? And it turns out these feedbacks come in many forms. What Gates is talking about here um, in, in these ones, um, and in fact, this one here as well, is what's called the reinforcing feedback. Um, this is something where the original change leads to ripple through changes that amplify the original change. So. Here, how's this? Okay, we have confusing code in a code base. 
it becomes difficult to know where to modify it. And so we end up hacking in additions. We bodge it and we try to kludge it and the code becomes even more confusing. And it spirals out from there, right? Um, this, is, uh, this is something which is undesirable. It gets worse and worse. I think uh, uh, Jay may have seen this as well. I think you may have been in 394. Um, alternatively, think about this is a bad case. This is a vicious cycle. There's virtuous cycles. This is something most companies want. This is something you folks may want soon enough, right? You have doctors and nurses and allied health professionals that are customers. They talk about your system you get other people excited about it who become customers. It goes viral. People start tweeting about, you know, the awesome card deck system, you know, coming out of, 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 of Canadian, used in Canadian hospitals. And you get this kind of virtuous cycle, right? That's what most companies want. That's how they grow really quickly. They get people talking about it, people buying it. Um, Here's another thing. We, we referred to this on our very first day, or first few days. You have unmanaged risk. The worse unmanaged risk, the more scheduled disruptions. The more scheduled disruptions are, the more that the less time is the risk. You're fighting fires, so you don't have time to really deal with prevention of further fires, and that leads to more unmanaged risk. This is a software project gone bad. I'll tell you. There's a lot of projects in the world like this. You hear people talk about it. They say we're constantly fighting fires. We, we, you know, it's just one crisis after the other. We're just rolling from one crisis to the other. And often, not always, but often, the drive for that is because when things are going wrong, you don't have time to manage other things, and they get out of hand too. So you get on top of the immediate fire, and guess what? there's another fire that's been brewing that you haven't had time to prevent because you've been so busy trying to douse what, what is going on that you've not stayed on top of this other issue. And now this customer is upset, this other customer due to a separate issue and you run over to that one. Um, so this is a vicious cycle that I warned you about. You know, Don't cut back on this time for risk management when things get tough. That's when you most need it because otherwise you'll get more unmanaged risk building up. Like people who drop out of the team or, 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 or don't participate or what have you. <coughs> Here's another common vicious cycle. Um, okay, so you get calls from customers. These STIs are not sexually transmitted infections, they are system trouble incidents, I should assure you, um, from customers. And <laughs> don't let your imagination run wild here. So there's STIs that are received from customers and, um, and this leads to emergencies. I tell you, there's few things to a small company that are worse than getting a call from a customer saying your system is not working. It's broken, we can't run it. Drop everything to try to fix it, it leads to high time pressure. And guess what? Jesse is writing code instead of testing soon enough. He's, he's, he's dealing with the irate customers on the phone, doing rollouts to customers, how to get the new version down, the new APK down, which hasn't yet had time to get out on, on uh, Google Play Store. And he's no longer doing quality assurance. He's no longer testing. And guess what? Things fall through the cracks. So that patch you rolled out to people, fix their problem, but now another problem's there. Now it's back to downloading from Axios and all the pictures they see are of a certain singer. Um, and, and, you know, Jesse doesn't have time to get back to testing and it just gets worse from there. Um, how's this? Okay, so you get overloaded, people get fatigued, there's morale problems, there's low productivity, people are sick of working on it, they're not working on max capacity, they're mixing their work with lots of other things which just have to get done, childcare for their family, um, uh, needs for dealing with financial matters, all sorts of things, and they're overloaded even more. And 
you know, it leads to burnout. Of course, where this gets really out of hand is the next cycle. The next is indicated in the next slide here. So, and you know, these things I've seen, I mean, I've lived through this. Hopefully you won't, hopefully you haven't. Maybe if you went through 332 this term, you would have. Um, but these are very real phenomena and I've seen them take a project down very, very quickly. So there's a backlog of work, developers are fatigued, morale is shot, and there's resignations. And the worst resignations are the most morale is. Why, why would um, resignations cause morale problem? Well, one thing is your buddies leave, right? You have a sense you're on a sinking ship. And in addition, what happens? Well, for the people who remain, there's more work for them to do. Why do I say that? Why is there more work for them to do, the people who remain? Because there's less people doing it. Yeah, there's less people doing it. The people who left were doing something. And now suddenly, who gets to do that? You do. <laughs> You're the one who's remaining. Who else is going to do it? Meanwhile, your friends at a new company, earning a higher salary, happy working with new technologies they're really interested in, and you're dealing with their fix-up work and code you don't understand that they wrote in a rush because of customer complaints. In addition, because of the resignations, you've got to hire more people and you end up spending quite a bit of your day interviewing people who may get paid to attract them higher salaries than you do. And you end up teaching them about the system which takes time away from your tasks. And it lowers team productivity even more. And there's a worse backlog of work and more developer fatigue and more people leave. Bad news, bad news. It goes without saying that when you have new people come in, also they tend to be uh, lower as well. Um, so, so you have to have worse training load on, on, um, on the old workers and so they have fewer, less productive work uh, um, that, that's finished. And as you have a number of new people, there's greater coordination required. And, and so the amount of, of work that needs to be done is higher. You need to um, do more um, mentorship on the code base, et cetera. Um, so these things are very common. And it turns out when you have these so-called positive feedbacks, these sort of feedbacks, where you have positives. And it turns out this is a positive feedback. This is a vicious cycle. Each of these leads to, uh, has a plus arrow associated with them and it, it, it worsens this. Um, each of these has a plus arrow. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a reinforcing feedback. When you have those, you tend to have things that worsen very quickly. We talk about a vicious cycle. It gets bad very quickly. So it might, you know, the morale goes, goes is shot within six month time. Um, things escalate, more and more people drop, the morale is, is further worsened, the load from hiring is worsened, et cetera. On the other hand, if it's a virtuous cycle, you can get this exponential growth, which we know, is a, com is a company with many companies. You think about Google hiring, for example, when it was in its breakout mode as a search engine in the early 2000s. Or you think about Facebook, or you think about Microsoft, you think about Twitter, etc. They went through these periods, long periods of exponential growth. So very much part of the Silicon Valley dream is to grow like that. It's what Skip the Dishes has gone through over an innovation place. And when you have this, you get this faster and faster growth. But it can be worse and worse when this is a vicious cycle like, like these are, okay? By contrast, negative feedbacks like this tend to be balancing, okay? Instead of leading to this, they lead to a regulatory component. So it tends to be brought in to a certain level that's in balance. It tends to bring it back. An excursion in terms of fatigue leads to more sleep, which tends to lessen fatigue. 
So you get the level of fatigue being brought back into a balanced state or similarly with mistakes and learning from mistakes. Just like, it's just like your car on the road, right? You're going off to the side, you steer back and it brings you back into alignment. You're hungry and you eat. You keep your body nourished. There's many homeostatic processes like this. And another, you know, you're thirsty and you drink. And basically, if you get thirsty, if you have an excur excursion, it brings it back. Does that make sense? And there's a lot of factors like this in software project management. These are some of them. And what I'm leading up to is one of the most important principles I'm hoping you're gonna carry away from this lecture. So when we have a software project, we often will have the risk of a vicious cycle like we've been talking about. You may recognize this diagram here, fatigue, morale problems, low productivity, overload. You may recognize that from, where is it? Um, here, from here, see this? There's a vicious cycle if low productivity leads to more pressure, which leads to greater fatigue and greater morale problems. This can be, a, uh, have a set of reinforcing feedbacks, we call them. They're also called positive feedbacks, not because they're good, but because a change in one thing leads to a ripple through set of effects that come back and amplify that original change. It pushes back in the same direction, it amplifies it. In contrast, this, oh, this is a negative feedback loop. It's a balancing loop. If this increases, this increases, which lowers that. Do you see that because of negative feedback? Here, by contrast, we're dealing with reinforcing feedbacks. This goes up, this goes down, this goes down, this goes down, and this, and this, uh, excuse me, this goes, this goes up, this will go up, this will go up, this will go down. This going down means this guy goes up, which further schedules disruption. So this is a reinforcing uh, feedback, as is this, as is this, and what that means is things can go out of control really quickly, just like this. Things can get worse and worse and worse. They build on each other. They snowball. It's a vicious cycle. It's a death spiral. There's all these different terms in English to refer to this. You will have heard, right? And what I'm saying is in software projects, to balance those things, to prevent them from taking over, what happens is we put in place regulatory mechanisms. And I've shown two, not the only, but two regulatory mechanisms here. One is morale building activity. So as morale problems worsen, we can engage in morale building activities, have team activities, um, you know, go out for dinner, um, have a movie night, um, uh, go and do some group activities in terms of sports. And morale building activities will lower morale problems. Or you have fatigue reducing activities. You take time off from work to recharge at some level. Um, so what are the reasons why a lot of companies a lot of big tech companies have game rooms or they'll have you know a place people can go and in, in a lounge um they'll have places where people can go and sleep they'll have places sometimes where people can take some quiet time away from work the point is these are regulatory in character there's a overall positive feedback that can spin out of control and lead to this sort of thing and you end up layering in Re, uh, layering in these balancing feedbacks, these, these regulatory feedbacks, which operate to keep it under control. Do you appreciate that? So that prevents it from spinning out of control because you have these things which bring it back into balance, okay? Fatigue reducing activities. You encourage your employees to go, you know, play some sports, to take some time off, 
on vacation despite being behind as a project yeah take time off it's good for you to go to the gym to do yoga whatever you you have them engage in activities that reduce their fatigue why because otherwise you're going to get this thing spinning out of control now the problem here is that managers who don't understand that engage in a perverse activity and this is what they do what do i mean by that well managers who are focused on how much are we getting out how much code is getting out are we behind if they're focused on the symptoms you know are we behind how many bugs are being reported by our systems um uh you know how much uh uh, how much cost are we uh, exerting on the budget? If they get caught up in those things, they end up saying, well, look, we've got to just put more pressure, for example, on people. Got more pressure, more push towards overload, and we got to get things done. They buckle down. They say, no time for morale-building activities or fatigue-reducing activities. You know, I want people here, um, uh, you know, anyone who wants to take more than two days of vacation, it's got to know me, let me know three months in advance. I've seen that. I've seen a memo go out with that effect. Um, uh, another case, um, you know, no taking time off in the next two months because we have this big deadline coming up. Um, or I want to see everyone here working extra hours just like I work extra hours. It's another thing, you know, if the boss is there, I expect you to be here. Basically, it ends up cutting these things. It ends up undercutting these regulatory feedbacks. And what do you think happens as a result? It goes out of control. It goes out of control. <laughs> now, what's another feedback uh, here that when things go out of control that, that can happen? Well, let's, um, let's consider this. Um, if we consider this, you may, may remember, um, if morale is really shot, what often happens as a result? Well, resignations happen. So if people's morale is being is shot and they can't engage in morale-reducing activities or fatigue-reducing activities at the company, they go elsewhere. You folks are graduating as software engineers. You have a pretty good set of opportunities available to you in any major significant city. You can walk with your feet away from a, a job that is not meeting your needs, and you can go elsewhere. And people do that. People leave. They resign. So if this company is not allowing them to do this, they will find another company that will. They will express their morale by voting with their feet and going elsewhere. That's one of the ways in which it, it comes out. There are other ways as well, which is um, people hide information from the boss, uh, hide from them the true extent of the quality problems. This happened one time with Microsoft Office. Bill Gates, uh, this was at a time I knew him. Um, uh, he was famous for sometimes getting upset if his high expectations were not met. Uh, Office Word, it was, uh, it was Mac Word, as I recall, um, was behind schedule. He was really not happy with the project. Uh, there were people responsible for developing it and, and dedicated test teams. And he got very, very upset to hear about the quality problems that they were encountering. He, uh, he found that it was going to make them even more late to market potentially raising the risk of other competitors. Even Apple was thinking about competing at this point with Microsoft Office, et cetera. Um, so he would go, he would get very visibly mad. So there was a testing manager who responded to that in an adverse way. He basically underplayed the seriousness of the bugs. So Mac Word had lots of bugs, but he played it down. He was optimistic. He said, look, you know, we'll be able to fix them. There's really not too many big bugs, etc." And he prevented Gates' wrath. 
But what do you think happened? They released the product. It's a complete disaster, complete market disaster. Um, this was back in the days of floppy disks. They had to ship out hundreds of thousands of floppy disks and patches because people would lose the ability to work with their old documents. It was a regression and a big regression. Gates was not happy. I think this guy was reassigned to the CD-ROM division or something like that. He was like exiled. They didn't tend to fire people, but they tended to, to exile them. But he responded to you know, managerial dysfunction. Um, Gates you know, berating people and not treating people well as a result of this by hiding information, which causes it to go even more out of problems. And it went out of control in this sort of way, where you know it just spiraled out of out of control with with um, uh, with types of problems. So this is an example of this loop. You know, there's managerial desire to blame, which means people share less information about them, which means Gates approved the release without really knowing the extent of the problems, which meant that the project was was a disaster, which meant to, you know, more, more blame. And it leads to problems between the managers and the developers. So suspicion, the managers got the screws on, who's gonna tell them about the real state of the, what was found in the um, code review? Who's gonna tell them about what's been found in testing? And then the manager makes worse and worse decisions based on it. It's, it's a real problem. And it's a problem that occurs also on projects um, under pressure. Okay. Um, so a lot of the problem here is that managers will tend to make, not all, but there's a certain set of adverse managers, and I've certainly met my share of them in my time as a professional, who focus on the symptoms. What are the symptoms? We're behind schedule. We are spending too much money. We have too many bugs. And they focus on the symptoms in a way that leads to naive responses, like you gotta work harder, or I wanna you know, dock anyone whose, whose code shows more than a fir uh, several defects per, you know, per certain amount of code, or Dock someone whose code review reveals uh, more than a minor, a minor problem with, uh, with defects. And you get these naive responses which worsen the situation. They cause worse fatigue. They cause worse morale. They lead to information hiding, which leads to worse managerial uh, decisions, but also more suspicion on the part of the manager. They're not knowing the full situation. It leads to resignations, and it leads to turnover. So what happens is part of this bigger system here that you see, you end up getting things going out of control along many of these feedbacks. So. Often thoroughness of testing is, is lessened. The quality of the product is less. People like producing quality product. They don't like producing poor quality product. That hits morale. But it also hits client satisfaction, which, and there's few things to a manager that are worse than a, company, a company's client saying, your product sucks. I'm leaving. I'm going to a competitor. You know, this is, this is a shitty product you have. Um, and they put on the pressure, puts it on the developers, and the developers who are really under pressure, working with fatigue, often put out less reliable bug fixes because the pressure for quick and dirty uh, fixes, and it leads to less thorough testing because of fatigue, and less uh, careful, um, careful contribution of initial code. And that leads to more debugging work, which leads more to project lateness, because you've got debugging, and before you can release, you have to do more testing. And if that discovers problems too, you have to go and fix it and then do more testing, or else you might ship it with a, a defect, and you get spiraling project lateness. A manager is more and more unhappy and puts in more of the screws. This is the risk. And of course, people resign, and the people who remain have higher tasks, uh, both in terms of work to do and in terms of training, et cetera. 
This is why it can go out of control very quickly. And a lot of what's at the heart of it is, is the project sane in terms of its code base? If there's a lot of defects and you don't know about them, you're screwed. Because guess who will know about them if you don't? It's the customer. If you have a product where you do know about those, those problems, and you can work to fix them. But a key thing is generating fewer of those problems so that you're not caught in this, this, this constant cycle of fixing them, debugging them, fixing them, retesting, and finding more issues and getting the, the pressure on there. Client satisfaction is driven hugely by lateness, which is driven by project quality, but it's also driven by defects in the code, which is a direct mark of, of uh, project quality, and that often leads to managers to respond unhelpfully. There are companies here in town, not too many of them, that have fallen prey to these sort of traps, trying to force people to work extra overtime. Saskatoon isn't bad for that, actually, compared to some companies. Others, like EA, Electronic Arts, are notorious for the very, very long hours and burnout. They just rip through people often, and it leads to resignations, but they have people applying out the door to sign up because they want to be game developers, and, and they just rip through them. But it is not something which is uh, uh, good for the workers. So here we have a broader system, and at the heart of it really is skin quality. Quality that impacts client satisfaction directly, quality that works through project lateness, um, it works through morale to lead to resignations, etc. Okay. We can get lock-in effects through this. This is another phenomenon. And in the software industry, you'll find some projects that are constantly in a firefighting mode, constantly in a mode of catch-up, constantly in a mode of needing to deal with low morale, high documentation, high turnover. Why high documentation? Well, if you have high turnover, you need lots of documentation to make sure the new people who come know what's going on. Um, it's burdensome to the developers who are there because of the high documentation. It's low morale. They tend to leave when they can. And the ones who stay are the ones with least other opportunities because they're not very attractive on the marketplace. On the other hand, you get crack teams like are famous within software. The folks who developed Microsoft's Excel, which I was a part of, fortunately, to be part of that team. The folks who developed the Macintosh, for example. Famous for putting out great quality stuff that, that it sets a new standard. Um, those sorts of teams have tend to have very high morale, tend to have low documentation needs, because the turnover is so low, they can keep a lot of it in their heads. They have such a cohesive team, they can share the information very readily. They don't need to write a huge amount of it down. The morale is very high. They attract really good people because of that. They have very good client satisfaction and managers know to give them the time to get the high quality, not to kill the goose who laid the golden egg to try to squeeze them, but rather to give them the time they need for, for good quality to have really impressive products. So what Steve Jobs want off it, you know, he wanted the highest, highest quality product. Um, and they tend to produce code, being really good developers, really high morale, really understanding the code base well, because they wrote it, not having to spend a lot of time training new people to come in. They tend to be folks who, who deliver things on time. This is the distinction. And a company can fall into the lock-in mode of being really low quality, high turnover, low morale, low quality very easily, or it can go in the other direction. And I've seen teams go from one to the other. Wrecked by what? By a project manager who's not effective at making decisions in response to symptoms that are, uh, that are out of whack. Okay. Um, I think I'll leave my comments on there like that. Um, I want to thank you for your time in this class. This class has
been far different than it has been in previous years, uh, going back till about 2008. Um, this class is smaller than at any time uh, in this class's history, which is particularly challenging because the class is designed to try to give a bit of the flavor of what it's like to work in a medium and large scale software project. And, you know, it's been more challenging this semester uh, because of that. You've also had other challenges ref which reflect the small size. One person going missing means a hell of a lot more impact on a five person team than on a 12 person team. The experience of coordination, of testing, and, and, uh, and development is a lot different on a five-person team than it is on a 12-person team where there's three testers and three developers. The coordination within that, within each of those teams. Um, I hope I've given you some of the basics, however, of these skills that will scale to larger teams, whether it's issues having to do with testing approaches, types of testing, UI testing, unit testing, system testing driven by, um, by, by calls and, and code, um, whether it's factors having to do with uh, scheduling or, or estimation, uh, whether it's factors associated with peer review and inspections as well as pair programming, et cetera. These are all principles that will make big projects go well also. Okay, um, putting in place the mechanisms for accountable positions, absolutely key. Well-defined build methodologies and repos to match that. Tools for offensive programming, uh, things like assertions. These are all things that big projects make heavy use of, of necessity. Um, and even if the experience hasn't been one of a large-scale project, I hope you've internalized a lot of these components. I also hope that you'll consider not making this class the last one you take in software engineering within this department. Um, uh, I, although I think some of you have taken, no, you haven't taken 470 yet. I, I have. Oh, you have, two of you, three okay. Three of us. Three, three of you, okay. So 470 is another class which exposes you to some elements of software engineering. It's evolved a lot since when I taught it, but, um, but it has some, some important elements there um, that uh, are valuable at a technical level. Um, and uh, there are additional principles that I hope all these classes will teach that really software engineering these days is a lifelong endeavor of learning. Um, the technologies are changing every few years. React Native wasn't here three years ago. It probably won't be you know, a really uh, big technology 10 years from now, but it's a really important one right now. Um, uh, cross, uh, cross platform frameworks like Google Flutter are, are um, achieving prominence. But what's, one of the things that's most exciting is the sort of techno uh, technologies that you've been exploring within this class. These JavaScript-based frameworks um, that React Native takes advantage of are now working with progressive web applications, PWAs, towards a presence that unifies um, app-based programming web-based programming and desktop-based programming in a way that's unprecedented for, in my experience, for dozens and dozens of years. You may have similar technologies operating in each of these platforms. And the time you've put in is well spent to learn these technologies. JavaScript, in many ways, is almost the assembly language of the, the new programming paradigm. It's not necessarily the final language you'll be using. You may be using TypeScript or, or Scala.js or other, other variants, but they compile to JavaScript, much as for years we've compiled to assembly language or machine language to, to run our code. You have JavaScript um, as kind of the lingua franca 
which with PWAs will be, will be spread across multiple platforms. But really, this is not just about that big change. This is about a constant process of learning over time. And learning not only in terms of technologies, but in terms of processes that work. Agile processes, which you've been applying in this class, spare you a lot of grief compared to the old waterfall model. If you had met Dr. Waba only at the end, you would have missed some pretty important opportunities for feedback and opportunities for him to be challenged in really thinking through what his vision was. Um, our understanding about how to develop software best, given the sets of technologies around and given what we learn from how to work with clients most effectively given those technologies is going to evolve. And it'll be your job as software engineers every few years to retrench to try to learn a set of new technologies and a set of new processes. Because at the end of the day, as I argued on the first day, what you should be looking for on an ongoing basis is not just the bugs to fix in your program, but the bugs to fix in your process or looked at on the flip side, how to improve your process best to deliver value so that you can develop solutions most effectively. I've certainly learned from this project. I trust that you've learned as well. And that's our job as software engineers, to engage in that sort of lifelong learning. Okay? Um, so it's been my real privilege to be with you this semester, to, and I appreciate your patience bearing with the, the need to kind of rejig the course. I am much looking forward to your ID5 presentation this coming Sunday morning, and to the pleasure of marking it on the 11th. Um, and I'm hoping that you can enjoy, uh, it, join me for that, uh, for that experience with a representative or two. I think given where you've come from, given the handicaps you've been dealt, I think you've done an excellent job thus far. And I'm really excited to see ID5. I understand that my enthusiasm is shared as well by the client, which is to your great testament. What you've managed to pull off is no mean feat. And I look forward to seeing how you wrap it up in this latest ID5. Um, but you're to be complimented for your uh, stick to a tividness and, and sticking through the, the um, uh, the uh, ups and downs um, of this uh, semester. So um, those are my last uh, prepared remarks. Uh, I would be delighted to talk with any of you further, um, uh, both uh, you know, in, in coming days. Certainly we'll get together for a review where I'll try to put together a lot of the principles of the class in a way that emphasize the major, the major issues. And I will uh, look forward to to reading your postmortems, which are delivered at the time of the exam as a component of the exam, the postmortem reflections, oh. um, you'll find that in the syllabus, okay? Um, but basically, it's a reflection on what went well, what didn't went well, how you could have done things better, um, uh, learnings technology-wise, process-wise, human theater-wise, etc. cetera. Um, and I would certainly be glad to talk with you after the class is over as well. Okay? okay. Good job. And I look forward to seeing you in 